I want to jump to the topic of oxygen, and this is going to sound like a really stupid question, but I promise uh, there's a lot more to it than maybe meets the eye. The importance of oxygen and what your research has has shown you in that realm. Yeah, I mean, uh, oxygen is pretty is pretty fundamental, and and uh, to me, there's like two angles to that. You can look at what happens if you get more oxygen, and what happens if you get less oxygen. So there, there's a lot of really cool research at altitude on on uh, not just how we react at in the short term, how, what it feels like to be at altitude if you're trying to climb Everest, but also how your body adapts over the long term to make do with less oxygen so that then when you go back to sea level, um, you, you're, you're performing better and you don't, you know, you can make better use of the oxygen. So altitude training has become a big, it's, it's long been a big thing in endurance sports like cycling and running, but now a lot of team sports are, are incorporating altitude into it. But, but more fundamentally, um, I think there's a lot of attention these days on this idea of VO2 max as the ultimate measure of kind of like fitness, aerobic fitness, and also as a really good predictor of longevity um, uh, of how are you doing? How are you going to be handling life when you're 80 or 85? Well, VO2, having a, having a, a, a healthy VO2 max is, is really important. And, and what VO2 max is, it's, it's simply a measure of how much oxygen you can take in and use and distribute to your muscles. So, um, you know, you can breathe as heavily as you want, but that doesn't do anything unless you're, while well, the oxygen is in your lungs, it's diffusing into your bloodstream and then your heart is pumping it to your muscles and then your muscles are taking it out of the bloodstream and using it to generate uh, the most efficient source of, of energy for your muscles, aerobic uh, through aerobic metabolism. So VO2 max is how much oxygen you can use, and that that's really a fundamental thing to performance, but also increasingly people are understanding to to long term health. What should um? Here's another challenging question. Hey, you know the golden question. Um, what should people do to increase their VO2 max? Fundamentally, they should move. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, um. You can you can get as specific as you want with like do interval workouts lasting between two and five minutes per bout repeated multiple times and that's probably the most effective VO two max increasing workout or do short high intensity interval training you know like thirty seconds as hard as you can with a, 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 a repeated you know four to six times. And that's a time efficient way of getting pretty good VO2 max results. But if there's one thing we can conclude from, you know, decades of, of endurance sports research, it's that there's a lot of different ways of increasing VO2 max and fundamentally do something that gets you out of breath uh, and do it regularly. So find something rather than thinking about what's the most optimal way of increasing my VO2 max. It's like I, the real advice is what is the most um, enjoyable for me, practical, feasible uh, thing that's going to fit into my life so that I'm doing it not just for four weeks while I'm motivated, but I'm doing it for four years or for the rest of my life. Um, because there's a classic, there's a guy named Michael Joyner, who's a very prominent physiologist from Mayo Clinic, who is also a very entertaining speaker and really creative thinker. And I've seen him give talks a few times, and he loves to give an example from the 1964 Olympic 5,000 meter final. He basically puts up a slide showing the finish and saying, this is everything you need to know about exercise physiology. Because in the top four runners that day were four very famous runners who represent basically the four main schools of thought about endurance training. You know, one guy did nothing but interval training, like literally every day, twice a day, he would go to the track and do, you know, 100 meters, take a jog, 100 meters, take a, he would do 20 by 100 or 4 by 40 by 100, nothing but interval training. Another guy did nothing but long, slow distance. Everything was a jog. So he did huge amounts of running. None of it was fast, but he just accumulated volume. Uh, another guy was basically uh, from the University of Oregon, a forerunner of the the kind of modern mixed training it got called the hard easy school for a while because you would do a hard interval day then an easy jogging day then a hard interval day then an easy jogging day another guy did uh, a guy named ron clark from australia did nothing but 
middle intensity runs, what we would now call threshold runs or tempo runs or lactate runs, maybe even zone two, zone three runs. Everything was like not a sprint, but not a jog. And the four of them, they, they all came, you know, they, it was a sprint finish. So there were many different roads that led to Rome and those Olympics were in fact in Rome. Um, and, and so you can pick your road, you, you know, and, and maybe that road is, is playing, you know, pick up hockey a couple of times a week and then getting out a few other times to do something else. Um, unless you're trying to win the Olympic marathon, you, it's more important to find something that, 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 uh, will fit into your life than it is to worry about the marginal 5% that you might get from doing the perfect workout.